Welcome to another exciting edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 501. So in 499 episodes, we'll reach 1,000. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashton, and it's May the 2nd, and it's the day when we remember St. Athanasius, and that will matter. Welcome to 501. Okay, you said St. Athanas. Let's talk about the creed. Let's talk a little bit about history because it seems to be happening all over again, Gavin. <clears throat> the Athanasian creed is fun. <laughs> 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 and, uh, but the reason, why, the reason why it's no bad thing to remember what Athanasius struggled with is because the heresies that the church faces are always the same. Uh, the devil has a, a, a strictly limited repertoire of things he can attack the church with and the same way he has a limited repertoire of things he can tempt us with. Um, but one of the critical ways in which the church has been hurt in the past is the diminution of the authority of Jesus. So a lot of people wonder quite what the value of, of the Trinity is. Um, the moment you move away from what the church has understood to be the classical doctrine of the Trinity, one of the things is to have a diminished Jesus. And the problem with the diminished Jesus, a, a Jesus who's a creature uh, or anything less than fully God, is the things that he said and he did become less potent. Now, that's taken advantage of by people who want to accommodate themselves to the world or to the culture or to the politics or to some other value system. What Athanasius did was to lead uh, a, a rebellion in the church of orthodox apostolic biblically minded Christians who confronted the zeitgeist of the day. The bishops had all become Arians. They, they were getting along reasonably well with a demoted Jesus because it was politically and culturally useful to them. The baptized said, we're not having this. And, and Athanasius led, led Orthodox bishops who reclaimed the church for Jesus. Now, why does that matter today? Because in so many of the things we're arguing about, uh, the, the teaching of Jesus about sexuality, about the kingdom, about the reality of Satan, uh, are, have been to some extent or other downplayed and diminished. And that's we're facing the same struggle that Athanasius did, and we need a few more Athanasiuses around today. That's yes, true, we do. Um, we, and, and we do have these figures, and most prominently, Bob Duncan has been referred to as an Athanasius figure, and there are other leaders of that caliber within the Anglican world. One of the problems is, is that not all bishops are Athanasius. Within the Anglican Church in North America and the Gafcon movement and the Church of England, we've got a fair share of duds. People who go along to get along, whatever going along to getting along means in that context. Well, in and this context, it, it, means, it means making accommodation with an increasingly secularized culture. And because there are no breaks, there is no red line, there is no, there is, there is no point at which this stops happening. It's a process of continual decay and until the standards of 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 a, a purer um more faithful christianity are turned back to and that happens by repentance but you're right george the so many of the leaders that, that we have and the episcopal examples we have and the cultures they adopt um are, are sub-christian mm. well let's talk about sub-christianity <laughs> yeah. in the anglican world that's the fun part that's the fun part that's what made us famous Let's talk a little bit about the breaking news today. We got a press release this morning. Actually, I got a couple emails and some Facebook messages. Kevin, did you hear? Let's, let's read this real quick. I am sure that you have reported on it, but I can't find it. Cana is leaving the ACNA. And three or four more people followed up with emails. Did you hear about this? Would you, so obviously, something's happening over at GAFCON. They're meeting in Australia. And uh, that means one of our fears that Cana would redefine their relationship with the ACNA has occurred. Now, let's back up. Uh, this show was brought into infamy or, or fame because of what happened with EMEA many years ago and Chuck Murphy. Uh, Chuck Murphy uh, was the leader of Abia, and he wanted to be sure that um, he kept the kingdom that he built up. And one of my fears that I've expressed many times is Cana has built a kingdom. And at some point in time, 
they're going to want to separate their kingdom from the ACNA and go about their own. And this is that day. You're going to see my face get a little redder as I report on this because um, this isn't how it's supposed to work. George's face is going to get red. Gavin has Those good color pressure. correction <laughs> on his camera. You're not going to see his I'm face get red. <laughs> and, you know, it, it, and, and so okay. here we are right now. Um, and I've been taught by my mom, if you have nothing good to say, you don't say it. Uh, what did your, your mom teach you, George? Finish your peas is all I can remember right. at this point. <laughs> Kevin, uh, I want to I want to preface everything that I say right now. It's that Satan is going to have a field day mm. with what we're going to talk about. This is the sort of nonsense, the sort of crap that Satan and the enemy seeks to use to destroy the church because it's so petty, so stupid, so unnecessary, it's so outside of the call for the church and for believers. Yet. What are we? What are we focusing on? Nonsense. Well, should we tell them what the nonsense is? Yeah, go ahead, George. Okay. <laughs> the uh, concordat was signed in Sydney tonight, uh, Thursday night, uh, between the Archbishop of the ACNA, Foley Beach, and Nicholas Oko, the Primate of Nigeria, redefining, or as they tell us, clarifying the relationship between the Cana and the ACNA and the Church of Nigeria. The old understanding had been that Cana bishops, just bishops, mind you, had a dual citizenship. They were members of the ACNA House of Bishops and the Church of Nigeria's bishops. The diocese, meaning the lay people and the clergy, were part of Cana, but they were part canonically under this ACNA. That has been under tremendous stress over the past year. And the source of the stress is the Bishop of the Diocese of the Trinity. There are three Cana dioceses, Cana East, Cana West, and the Diocese of the Trinity. I do not think all three Cana dioceses are going to move in lockstep on this. The Diocese of the Trinity is for Nigerian expatriate uh, Christians in the United States, Anglicans. They've been behaving very badly over the past few months. We had the incident earlier this year when, without consultation with the ACNA, they had the Church of Nigeria appoint four suffragan bishops, including one who holds to non-Orthodox values and doctrines on the issues of the prosperity gospel, the word of faith. They've done it again. The, they, this particular diocese has raised tribe, race above Jesus Christ. They want their Nigerian ethnicity to be triumphant over uh, the ethos of the ACNA, which is that we're a post-cultural church, post-racial church. We are a church of believers where there's neither slave nor free Jew, free Greek nor Jew, male nor female, but we're all one in Christ. The Diocese of the Trinity wants us to be one as Nigerians, Oh, and by the way, we're going to have four bishops and we're going to divide them among the tribal groups in the Nigeria and replicate that in the United States. And now these jackasses have opened the door to the fracturing of the ACNA. Um, I'm just appalled. And part of this is, I, uh, part of this is, is that the ACNA has never had any problems disciplining bad bishops in the past. Chuck, the Diocese of All Saints, whenever they uh, get up and antsy about we're going to walk out over the women's issue they get slapped down well because they're a little forward in faith diocese they can be and they're white americans they can be told what to do when chuck murphy got too big for his boots and basically wanted to be king and keep all the uh keep all the toys in the room he was slapped down but because we're dealing with the church of nigeria's bishops who are not uh culturally or theologically on the same wavelength as acna acna backs off and pays deference to uh, racial issues. And this is what Gavin is talking about, of allowing the values of the world, class, race, culture, to be paramount over the values of Jesus Christ. And it's that serious an issue. It's a, it's a, it's a hard one to, to, to swallow. And I feel the same way now I did uh, when we were being attacked by EMEA. Uh, I just I get that unease that you know this is hopefully this will turn out well 
and uh, the EMEA thing. It's not so all of Cana. It's not all of Cana. And see, yeah. the majority of our viewers who belong to Cana belong to Cana East or Cana West. Sure. And they're probably going, what are you guys talking about? I mean, this is totally news to us. Yeah. We're talking one bad apple has has infected the rest of the basket. One bad bishop and his cohort have basically started an avalanche that, that could undermine the very edifice. Because if uh, being if if it is paramount to have a certain color and a certain tribal bishop have authority and and uh, allegiance go in one direction, it's a better argument to split over women bishops. It's a better argument to split over the filial clause in the creeds. It, there are lots of better arguments that ACNA has been successfully able to finesse to build the kingdom and allow race is just extraordinary it is now the leadership in the uh anglican communion justin welby ferone and all the others are looking and saying ha you guys aren't so hot after all you told know you we, so. we told, told you, you so. so this is you guys you're fighting over this you know so let's move on and talk about some international politics Justin has given some interviews. They're having the ACC conference. Ferone is throwing the uh, Global South under the bus. Uh, same old, same old, George. What's new? Yeah. Uh, Josiah Dawa Ferone said these sorts of criticisms. I can first remember him going public uh, about two and a half, three years ago, when at a meeting of mission society directors in London, he proceeded to attack the Gafgon primates as being un-Anglican and seeking to destroy the kingdom, that they were power-mad autocratic dictators. And it was the ACC office in London who was going to counterbalance their megalomania. And then we had the whole incident of uh, the fiddling of who gets to be a delegate from Kenya, where the Bishop of Nairobi forged the signature of the, bishop, of the Archbishop to allow him to go. And in return, Adaibu Ferron and friends made him a member of the standing committee. Uh, you know, so the, the monkey business has been going on. And every time Adaibu Ferron gets onto the topic of Gafcon, he let mm -hmm. lo lets loose on them. Well, he let loose on Gafcon once again, saying they're the problem within the Anglican communion. If they only would be loyal and keep their mouth shut and not worry about faith and order and... Uh, the Bible all would be well, and Justin would have a happy day, and we could all go to an unending series of conferences on mosquito nets and uh, so on and so forth. No. If only Gafcon could be bought off like all the other Anglican provinces with Trinity Wall Street money. That's what I heard implied. Oh, in, in my parish life, and I'm sure Gavin has come across this, it's like the husband who says, I can't see why my ex-wife is still mad. Uh, you know, why is it? Why is it, why is it, why is she still mad at me for leaving her and the kids and poverty while I'm off buying sports cars and hanging around with young girls? It's just not fair. <laughs> uh, Gavin, your your Archbishop of Canterbury's uh, done gone crazy. I've seen some interviews where he says, you know, it was really really hard not to invite the gay spouses of bishops to this Lambeth 2020. It, it just killed me on the inside. And I'm like, no, it didn't. You don't even know what you're doing. This thing is a mess. It's going to blow up in your face. Will there even be a Lambeth 2020? Uh, what's, the, what's the latest going on over there? Well, one of the things that's happened over here is a, a crisis that's rumbling under the surface that may very well blow up before Lambeth 2020. And it's to do with Justin Welby's friendship with a man called John Smythe. So in the last week, Panorama, the BBC, have started sniffing around safeguarding for the Church of England. And they went to the Diocese of Lincoln and they came up with some historic examples of uh, bishops who, when they were faced with serial predators, uh, interviewed them, asked them if this ever happened before. No. So this was a one-off. Yes. So I need to ask no more questions. No, you don't. And they didn't. <laughs> and then these, these um, wretched people went on causing... Uh, a great deal of, of pastoral, emotional, and spiritual damage. Now, <clears throat> they had the lead bishop of safeguarding, Peter Hancock, on, who's becoming increasingly uh, a sort of Tony Blair, Teflon man, but to nothing sticks. Um, he's doing as well as he can. But 
there's a worried look at the back of his eyes. And I think the worried look is to do with the fact that people are saying Justin Welby hasn't been telling the truth about what he knew about these Smythe Bible camps. Uh, so if it turns out that he knew more than he did, then he too becomes one of those people who knew but did nothing. And for this to be traced right back to him will seriously uh, undermine his credibility. There are a number of, of issues which um, the Church of England hasn't dealt with. So although it's putting in millions of pounds into safeguarding, making all the right noises, forever bleating that horrible trope, lessons will be learned. The fact is, it hasn't cleansed the stables yet. It hasn't said sorry for the things it's done wrong. The, the great Jersey Day Barclay is still hanging on there, undealt with and covered up. The George Bell thing increasingly looks like what we've always said it was, uh, an attempt to make a lightning conductor to draw the attention away from other people who ought to have been held accountable. Um, all this is bubbling away under the Church of England. The BBC is sniffing after it. I suspect one or two people are going to try and blow the whistle and give them more evidence. And what's required is for the Church of England to uh, fess up completely and say, this is the full... Um, this is the full picture of the extent to which we hid paedophiles and sexual predators. Uh, but I'm afraid it goes right to the door of Justin Welby. George, um, I see that gay spouses are not invited. Are they going to do anything about atheist spouses? No. Uh, let me talk, what are we talking about? Lambeth Conference <coughs> excuse me, is right. making a big noise about inviting all the spa all the bishops and all the spouses except for the acna and brazilian bishops and then uh they say and then there's been all this furore from the right and the left uh, that we're not going to invite the two and a half uh gay spouses two and a half because one of them still has to be uh consecrated and that'll mm -hmm. happen this summer but there'll be three three gay spouses and justin well we contacted the uh, suffragan Toronto uh, Robertson uh, this December and told him that I'm sorry you can't bring your partner because the conservatives who are coming just won't wear having having him there and he also talked to Mary Glasspool the suffragan of uh, New York and said she can't bring her partner and Josiah Wadawa Ferron made a public statement saying that we must honor the resolutions of Lambeth 110 which say that homosexual uh, conduct behavior is contrary to scripture. And so we cannot bring to this conference people who are avowedly publicly violating that agreement with the last one. That's a good theological argument. Whether you agree with it or not, it's an argument. Mm -hmm. Justin Welby has since cut the legs out from underneath the Dawah Pharaoh in now for first telling the times and then repeating in an open session in Hong Kong this week that he really had a difficult time in telling the uh, gay bishops with spouses that they may not bring their spouses because he said, I had to uh, basically decide, do I sacrifice you two so that everybody else can come uh, who would be opposed, or do I do the right thing and invite you two and take the consequences? Now, Andrew Goddard, has written a marvelous piece that Ian Paul has republished, and I hope to be able to publish it too, um, where basically pointing out that th uh, that this is very much like Caiaphas. Uh, that's it's a fashion exactly narrative like saying uh, it is better for one man to be sacrificed than the people to suffer. Now, J Justin's will be his argument that it's, well, first off, what, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, there's so many things to go here. Uh, to say basically i'm doing this to make sure that we get the maximum number of people here that's not why you do things theologically you do things because it's right or it's wrong and on this point i really agree with some of the gay activists saying this is no reason whatsoever you if it's right it's right if it's wrong it's wrong now i happen to agree whether it's right or wrong with with our friends on the other side sure but the second thing is what is the point why are we even talking about spouses See, there are a number of spouses of bishops in the uh, in the Episcopal Church and the Anglican Church of Australia and the Anglican Church of Canada who are quite publicly atheists. The husband of the bishop of Archbishop of Perth, 
does not believe in Jesus Christ as Lord. He doesn't believe anything. It's not that he's a quiet, mumbling agnostic. He's an outspoken about not believing. The gay partner of the suffragan of Toronto happens not to be Christian either, but it doesn't matter because he's gay, he can't come. Now, if here's the joke. If you deny Christ and are a spouse, you can come to a conference. If you're gay and believe in Jesus, like the suffragan of New York's uh, partner, you can't come. Uh, and then the in the sort of footnotes of all that they're going to do, they're opening up the whole conference to the spouses, to everything. Now, at one time, bishops had voice and vote. In 1998, they had voice and vote. 2008, they just had voice because they got rid of votes. Now, they're diluting it even further by having the wives sit in on most of the sessions. What is the point? I mean, is it just, see, let me explain. Why do spouses even go? I don't know. 30 years the, ago, they uh, didn't. Well, no, they've always come. Years ago. The wealthy American and Canadian and later Australian bishops would bring their wives for a fun trip to England. In 1988, uh, Mrs. Runcie, I think it was, organized a Ladies' Day outing. And just imagine a Christchurch College in Canterbury, where basically it's ladies with teacups, and large handbags and silly hats. Um, that's what it was. It was just sort of to keep the ladies busy while the men were working. Eileen Carey took it a little bit of step further and sort of organized activities and things to to talk about among like-minded women because there were no, I don't think there were any male spouses. No, there weren't male spouses in 98. 2008, Jane Williams took it even further by trying to have programs and activities for the male and female spouses. And now we've got this new model, which has been called cultural, that in some African diocese, the woman, the wife, has just as major roles as the husband, and she has a ministry too. And we're going to include them in the ministry and deliberations of the Catholic Church Universal. I think the tone of my voice is giving away the fact that I oh, find this really it's problematic. So but it's so crazy. I mean, we, we've now, we've, I don't know if they're going to have any vote this time either. Have you seen the agenda? Are they going to vote on anything besides mosquito nets, or I don't know. We don't know the uh, the if you well, let's just look at some of the hard facts of PR. Mm -hmm. Ninety eight, the press was all over that place. Mm -hmm. Two thousand and eight, most of the majors were gone. Uh, in 98, I can remember Times, Telegraph, Guardian, Independent, even the Scottish newspapers, all the British national newspapers, the New York Times, uh, the Washington Post, everybody was there. The networks were there. Christiane Amanpour was there with her truck from CNN, simultaneously broadcasting. Those people were gone in 2008. So that 2008, the Washington Post was represented by yours truly uh, not one of their not one of their uh, uh stars by any way shape or form will there be anybody this time around does anybody care no last time we had a, a, a press conference at canterbury i think three quarters gap you can correct me on this kevin three quarters were activists from mm -hmm. organizations oh, yeah, absolutely yeah we were in the, in the no, darwin was, room <laughs> the press, you know, the BBC had the local Kent, the Kent reporter mm -hmm. there yeah. who knew nothing about anything. I mean, you know, who is he and what does he do and what question should I ask? Yeah, I remember that. No, but the world no longer cares. Yeah. And maybe that's a good thing for Justin Welby. I don't know. But it's, it's a lie. It, this whole sense of the Catholicity of the church is represented by the bishops at Lambeth. It's now turned into a, a shallow, hollow, horrible lie as to what the church really is. It's been a bad week for Anglicans. I, I don't know if I... <laughs> well, let's move on to Gavin. You've just depressed us so bad, George. Gavin, it's been a bad week for Anglicanism. It is, although I think that what we're facing is a, an earthquake. 
Uh, and in the life of the church, um, as things get worse, the Holy Spirit works ceaselessly to uh, alert people's consciences and their hearts and their minds. One of the things that I'm finding is that I'm, I'm getting a steady stream of, of emails and messages on social uh, media saying thank you so much for, you know, not just me, all of us, for, for speaking the truth and keeping the faith going. And um, there are a lot of Christians out there who feel a, a real stress in terms of the pressure that's put on them in the world. In, in the aftermath of the Sri Lankan bombing, uh, as, as there's a greater awareness of the way in which a, a more virulent secularism is trying to close Christianity down. This is not just a domestic Anglican problem, not even in terms of worldwide Anglicanism. This is a, we're, we're reaching a very significant point in, in cultural history where Christianity is fighting for its life with some very serious opponents. And that's one of the reasons why it matters that uh, Orthodox Christians should band together as enthusiastically as they can to keep a very clear focused sense of what the faith is, what it calls us to and what it tells us about human beings and the world. So yes, the news is bad. The accommodationists uh, are, are rushing pell-mell into a, an improper perversion of the faith. But there are a good many people who love Jesus, are faithful sons and daughters of the church, uh, and who are determined to go on praying, go on witnessing and go on agitating. Let me give you an example of, of why I you, you, some uh, I think a criticism that could be raised against my comments is that you're really taking this stuff way too seriously, George. I mean, uh, chill out, calm down. Well, why is it? Why does it matter that that we should strive for a church of holiness, a church that seeks to be faithful to Christ no matter what? 400,000 people have died in the civil war in South Sudan in the past few years. It's, we're not talking about the Muslim cartoon government murdering the uh, Darfuris and the people in the Nupa Mountains. We're talking about the Noor and the Dinka, mm -hmm. the two primary tribes at war, and the president and the vice president of different tribes at war with each other, and the peripheral tribes, especially in Equatoria, choosing sides and the cartoon government having fun destabilizing the government. And the church in South Sudan has again and again and again tried to move the people out of the tribal mindset, out of the cultural mindset of that I'm a Noor first, I'm a Dinka first. And what help do they get from the most powerful church in Africa? Well, they see the tribalism running rampant in some of the actions of the church in Nigeria. Thank God, though, it's in America, not here. What do they see in the Church of England? They see the Church of England kowtowing to the British government's latest positions on African affairs. The church is not a prophetic voice. Well, and for so us... Their, 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 <clears throat> their imperative to save their people from death and damnation is undermined by the inability of the Episcopal Church, the Church of England, now the ACNA, to get their act together and be faithful preachers of the gospel in all seasons, in all climates, in all cultures. And of course, the, the struggle in different parts of the world takes a different form. Uh, we have a philosopher called Sir Roger Scruton, who's just been hung out to dry uh, on because he's been lied about by a progressive left journalist. One of the things Roger Scruton has been saying is that homophobia and Islamophobia are made up terms to stop the truth being told. The truth that, that is being told is the Christian truth. It's, it's, uh, the Christian truth is Islam and Christianity are different. The gods uh, but Christianity and Islam are different. Not many people know, but, but, but the figures in the, in the Quran that Muhammad made up, uh, Abraham, Noah, uh, Moses, Jesus, Mary, these are fictional uh, creatures from Muhammad's imagination. They bear no relationship whatsoever to the Bible. Um, in, in our country at the moment, you can't talk about the difference between Christianity and Islam without becoming increasingly uh, at risk of some form of criminal activity. The interesting thing is whether, however strongly one feels of compassion to people, towards people who are different, and one does as Christians, nonetheless, uh, homosexuality has been used by the devil as the means of crippling the church and stopping it talking about the sanctity of the family 
and the sanctity of sexual relations. So these two weapons are demoralizing Christians and silencing them in our culture. The tribalism we suffer from, I think, is, is uh, one in which people want to be seen as secularly acceptable rather than faithful to Jesus and the worldview Jesus came to bring. Uh, up until now, you were able much more easily to, um, to have dual nationality. But the circumstances in our culture are you either now have to choose to be a Christian or to be a secularist. There's no middle ground. And it's not, Ang it, Gavin, it's not just uh, English culture. We saw the New York Times distribute a cartoon among its news syndicate of Donald Trump uh, as a blind man dressed in Hasidic Jewish garb with a skull cap, black glasses, being led by a long uh, dachshund with the head of uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu. Uh, with wow. the big star of David Collar. Uh, and Netanyahu was drawn with an aggressively hooked nose. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. this was this was the New York Times. Mm -hmm. This was not Der Sturmer. This is not something from our history books. Mm -hmm. This is the New York Times publishing as vile and anti-Semitic caricature as it's possible to be. This past weekend, uh, we, ha we had our Holocaust Day uh, Sunday service where we go, well, we had about 30, 40 members of the congregation go over to the synagogue for Sunday afternoon service where we remember and recount the, the six million who died in the Holocaust. And I've been doing this forever since I moved to this community. It's an annual, it's our annual thing. And fewer and fewer Christian churches take part and the conversations have been changing over the years where I'm talking to the Jewish retirees from New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, Connecticut, who are basically telling me that they can't believe that there are now open anti-Semites mm. in Congress. Mm. They can't believe that the, you know, these are people, you know, I, I, one guy said, I marched with the civil rights movements and now black activists regard the Jews as being just as bad as the worst uh, white racist Ku Klux Klan member. I mean, the, the specter of anti-Semitism is no longer a disreputable thing that we try to uh, rubbish and hide. It's out in public, and it's actually worse in Europe, much worse in Europe. But the, the flow of this new cultural, intellectual, and spiritual movement is moving very fast indeed. And, and that's one of the reasons why it's absolutely incumbent upon the church to bear a witness to protect the Jews against anti-Semitism. We all know that anti-Semitism is essentially satanic at root, uh, with the rage of evil against God's chosen people and his chosen project. But it becomes all the more astonishing that our Christian leaders, Athanasius would have something to say about this, that our Christian leaders remain silent as the church continues to compromise and not stand up against this cultural flow uh, that is so destructive towards Christendom and Christian values. It's more than enough for the church to be talking about. And But what are they talking about? Mm. Things of no consequence. Yeah. Pretty sad. Okay, guys, we, we've just depressed our audience for 30 minutes. Uh, your hope is in no, Christ. No, no, we, 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 <laughs> we inform them. We <laughs> focus on what matters. Well, I know. Kevin, it's, it's no, true. we have not. We've, I, I disagree with you on that point. Oh, no, I, I was saying may, that jokingly. Of course, we... Some, uh, some people may find this all very disconcerting, but it mm -hmm. starts with what you, Kevin, and you, Gavin, said at the very start. Mm -hmm. It was the bishops, it was the institution that went mm -hmm. bad in which Athanasius rallied the believing people to overturn and to purify the church. Yeah. The Arians were the institutions. The Arians were the house of bishops. Mm -hmm. The Arians were the university professors. And it was the people with their, with the faith revealed through scripture and lived in the life of the believer who took it back. And, you know, Gavin and I are clergy. We're going to fight the good fight. But at the end of the day, it's Kevin and the lay people who watch this show, who believe they're going to be the ones who are going to be the engine to change. We can cheer them on. But. This is the call, fellas. The revolution begins with you. Well, I got to tell you, I've always believed laity is the first order of the church. You know, your clergy, others, that's the second order. Um, it's, it, 
you know, we're going to have to watch what happens, but most importantly, you need to pray and participate. Been a wonderful show, guys. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and you've been listening to episode 501 of Anglican Inspired and Unscripted. <laughs>